All right, guys, uh, grab that last string. Go ahead and have a seat. We're about to get started with Tron presenting. And I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit today about uh, blockchain and decentralization. And really, you know, kind of where I fit into this is, is why is this important? What, I mean, you guys are looking, right? Think, think about the questions you guys were just asking the, the last presentation. You guys were asking questions because some of it's concerning, right? <laughs> we got a Black Mirror episode going on where, uh, you know, facial recognition is all in a database. It's pretty crazy when you think about it. And when you, when you think about where's that data, you know, like they're able to get access to this database. Well, I don't know if facial recognition, our names and our facial recognition, I guess if it fell into the wrong hands, I could actually think of some scenarios that would be pretty bad, right? So with blockchain and cryptocurrency, what we're trying to do is make it so that data is stored in a decentralized manner. If Mark Zuckerberg wanted to go to your Facebook account and he wanted to uh, go into the Facebook office and say, listen, uh, person who's in charge of accounts, person, uh, John Doe, I, I don't like their political affiliation or I don't, I don't like their content or even something crazy like this is someone who ran me off the road and through their license plate I found their name. Let's look up their Facebook profile. He can get all of the data on you that he wants because it's all there, right? One person at Facebook could go into those servers and could get all of your information. But when things are stored in a decentralized way, then all of the data isn't in one point. So that can't happen where someone can't come in and get all – they would have to pull the information from a ton of different networks uh, to be able to get the, the same amount of information. And, and that's one reason why decentralization is so important. So um, I am a certified boomer. How many of you guys know what a boomer is? Oh, uh, you think you know. You think you know. The kids, the kids these days, right? Uh, a boomer is anyone that's over 30. So you got boomers and zoomers, guys. So I'm, I'm over 30, and so in, in the space that we're in, that's actually kind of old. A, a lot of people in this emerging technology are in their young 20s. Ah, uh, see, they've reinvented the rules. They've reinvented the rules. Yeah, yeah, this is social media lingo, guys. This is not textbook, okay? That's what I'm trying to tell you. They've grouped you into two categories. You're either a boomer or a zoomer, okay? So um, I'm a crypto journalist. I have a website, bitboycrypto.com. Uh, I host two podcasts, uh, the Bitboy Crypto News Podcast and also Beards and Bitcoins. Crypto community member, and as someone on uh, Reddit said uh, when they were giving me a terrible comment about a video, they said, don't listen to this guy, he's just a tuber. So I've kind of adopted that. Um, but you guys can follow me on social media, uh, BitBoy Crypto, pretty much everywhere. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, uh, YouTube, and TikTok. So Decentralized America, what is, what is this about? This is about restoring power to the individual, returning power to the individual. In kind of like this data rush that we've had over the last few years, um, really about the last 10 years, uh, or maybe even longer, some people would say, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of lost our, our identity a little bit, right? Where all of, our, all of our attention, all of our data is being monetized by these giant corporations 
And they're getting slaps on the wrist when they get in trouble. They're, they're not really getting punished, right? Uh, the, the worst punishment that Facebook gets, they might get a fine, a monetary fine, whatever. But Mark Zuckerberg you know, has to go in front of Capitol Hill and uh, uh, answer to people who are probably already in his back pocket. So there, there's no accountability. And so for, for us at Decentralized America, we want to return that accountability. We, we want to take uh, you know, decentralization to the next level. We're living in a, in a brand new economy. Like in the last several years, uh, you know, call it the, the gig economy or uh, the type of economy that allows um, you know, workspaces like down here um, in, in this mall to happen. It's just a different, a different place that we're living. But really what's important is to understand where, where we've, how did we get here? How, how did we get here? Uh, my generation, right, uh, we have failed. I started as a person in uh, elementary school that we were playing the Oregon Trail when I first started, right? By the time I graduated high school in 2001, we were using the internet for almost everything. So it was such a crazy transitional time in the world, and we botched it up big time by basically clicking I agree to everything. Just if it's there, we click I agree. Uh, you know, if Facebook wants to use our data, that's okay. If, if, if this app wants to authorize this, this, and this, well, we want to use the app, we got to use the app, so we just click agree. And we've really created this Orwellian society right now, where 1984 is in the past, both literally and figuratively in terms of the book 1984. If you look, I mean, guys, think about what we were just talking about with the biometric scanning, okay? Uh, in the book 1984, People are getting arrested for even the thoughts that they have. And you can really look at censorship today across the internet, and you can see that that same thing is kind of happening. Obviously, if you look at security cameras, every, they're everywhere. I mean, I bet you if I really sat around here and looked, there's got to be some security cameras around here somewhere, right? They're, my kids are growing up in an environment, they're four, six, and eight. My kids are growing up in an environment where if there's not a camera, they're kind of weirded out by it. Like, Dad, where's the cameras at? They're four, six, and eight. This is a different society that, that we're living in. And it's one where some of the more powerful people are, are just really um, you know, manipulating us and taking advantage of us, um, especially from a data standpoint. It's really important to remember that you know, a lot of people, when it comes to your data, a lot of people will say things like, well, I don't have anything to hide. But, you know, I don't have anything to hide. There's no reason why I should be really concerned about you know, Facebook taking my data or the fact that your phone, you guys think about this, your passport's great, your driver's license is good, but the thing that really is the biggest identifier of you is your phone. Everywhere you go, that phone goes. Every time that phone crosses a Wi-Fi network, it, it's pinging, right? You can follow the maps of, of any person you ever wanted to know. There, there's ways on the internet uh, that, I just watched a video on the other day, I can't remember the name, uh, I think it's called Wiggle is the name of it, but it's a way that you can actually track IP addresses of phones by where they ping. And if you know what the IP address of that person's phone is, you can follow them every single place that they go. Anybody random, just a random person, if you know their IP address. Um, and, and you got to remember that those are permanent records, permanent records. The phone companies keep that record of you for, your entire, for their entire existence. And what is legal today, you have to remember, may be illegal tomorrow. So if you think you don't have anything to hide, who knows what's going to be illegal in 10 years from now? I use the, the example of like, at some point it's probably going to be illegal to eat meat. You know, you'll have meat uh, made in laboratories or whatever it might be. And that maybe that's not it. But the fact is, is that there are things that are illegal and looked down upon today that 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, that it wasn't like that. So the fact that these are permanently records that are tracking, permanent records that are tracking every single place that you go, it is a problem. And we really led down to these slippery slopes of just giving up our privacy, giving up um, you know, everything about us to these companies, like specifically Facebook and Google and Apple. Those are probably the three worst offenders. So, so what is at stake here with decentralization? Uh, know your worth. If you break down per American, uh, how much your attention is worth. Uh, your attention is worth uh, over a year's period. It's worth about 600 or so dollars. Each person in America, that's how much your attention is worth. So if, if you guys, are, that's based on uh, data being considered or valued as of two years ago, a $1 trillion asset. 
$1 trillion across the world globally. And so uh, you have to, we have to get to a point where we understand that these companies are taking our data, they're taking advantage of us, and they're basically stealing from us. That's our attention. We should be getting paid for the ads that we look at. Um, if you know anything about advertising and ad networks, there, there's a whole lot of layers to it. But in cryptocurrency, there's something called the Brave Browser. The Brave Browser is the decentralized browser. And if you use that browser, then you can actually get rewarded for watching ads instead of someone else making money on those ads. And this is something that right now is really in its infant stages. But you guys are going to realize that over the next few years, that this is something that's going to be a very popular topic um, when it comes to uh, you know, monetizing your attention. So, uh, do we want a utopian future or a dystopian future? What's that? Yeah, well, probably somewhere in the middle is where we're gonna land, right? Uh, but the way, that, the way that a lot of these companies and a lot of these countries wanna portray the future to us is this utopian society where we are, um, you know, there is no, um, when it comes to money uh, and, and, and tracking uh, transactions, there's a large push to make it where every single transaction you make is tracked, right? You guys heard of a cashless society? Yeah. Yeah, this is scary as crap, guys. It really is. Uh, and a lot of the, the thing that's pushed on us is, oh, but there will be no more black market. Oh, but there will be no way for people to exchange value that are criminals. And that just simply is not true. We all know that criminals will always try to get around the law. And so, uh, you know, when we have a society where nothing we do is private, in my opinion, it's heading much more towards a dystopian future than a utopian. And when you think about every movie you've ever seen that's one of these, you know, end of the world movies, I mean, it's all basically comes from a controlling government. And, you know, whether you think America is or not, it, in my opinion, it, it could be heading that way, but there's a lot of places in the world that definitely are. And so future generations are also at stake. I think that people, depending on how we do over the next few years, I feel like people are going to look back at, um, in my generation, is that we failed everybody. Because, unfortunately, we have failed when it comes to, uh, you know, like my kids are all over the internet, you know, and they're four, six, and eight. My wife has a blog. She has social media. You guys probably put your kids on Facebook. Maybe some of you don't. But where's their privacy? When did they get a say on that? You know? Um, and I'm not saying you're bad parents if you do that. I mean, my wife is as good of a, of a mom as ever. But the fact is, is that the world is changing. And we've got to learn to take some of these back and be a little more conscious about the way that we are going uh, about things. Um, and one other thing I want, to, I want to ask you guys, how many of you guys who were not there this morning, how many of you guys have heard of a secret consumer score? One person. One person in the back. What, what is a, consumer, uh, a secret consumer score? Uh, I've heard that there's the one that, that is being advertised for the monitor. Right. Well, when it comes to credit, that that is something that um, you know you still do have a credit score. The consumer score, what it does, and this is not a conspiracy, guys. You guys can look this up. There's eight companies. The top one being SIFT. S I F T that basically what they do is they grab your data from all kinds of different places, um, and that determines whether or not a store will take your return. That determines how long you wait on hold. That, depend, that determines your customer priority. This story was just printed, or just printed in the New York Times four days ago. And California has actually made it where, at this point going forward, that you can request that data. So if you email, I believe it's privacy at sift.com and ask for your report, they're by law required to send it to you. Guy did that recently, 400 pages. 400 pages. That's how much data is being collected. And when, when we talk about all this stuff, and it, it, it sounds like it's fantasy land a little bit, like it's tinfoil hat theory. But this stuff is happening. This stuff is going on right now. How many of you guys have seen The Great Hack? If you've not seen that, you need to. It, it is about Cambridge Analytica, how they got five, how basically they tricked everybody into getting 5,000 data points and single-handedly swinging the U United States presidential election by targeting the 2% of people that could possibly change their mind. I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, but. Um, so the ways that we are losing, censorship, cancel culture, obviously on social media, we know all about censorship. Uh, the YouTube shooting that occurred a few years ago happened. 
uh, because uh, someone was demonetized, and you have these faceless companies that you can't ever talk to a person, basically uh, making decisions that affect people's livelihoods and their families, and they're never held accountable for it. And so, obviously I'm not advocating that that happen, but at the same time, when you have people's lives hanging in the balance, then those are the type of decisions that people that are desperate make when they're not able to talk to another human. You can't get in touch with YouTube. That's not a thing you can do um, if, they, if they cancel you or censorship. Uh, banks and middlemen, banking as of 2016 was a $134 trillion value business in the world. Um, imagine if we didn't need those banks. Imagine if I could send you money and you could send me money back and we didn't need that third party. That's really where cryptocurrency comes in. We've already talked about cashless society, desensitization. You guys hear this stuff, data. If you don't really start digging into it, um, you know, it kind of becomes one of these things that's just a buzzword. Um, so reversing course, um, we can do this by decentralization, by sending money peer to peer, uh, stop accepting the status quo. Earlier today, I heard, I, I, in the earlier, is, is the guy that asked me the question here that was there this morning? No. He, he asked me a question. He said, well, you know, you, you sound like my kid that wants to play video games to get everything for free. Come on, bro. But, <laughs> but I t you know, he went on to explain he does credit card transaction uh, processing. And I mentioned that that's something that I don't think we're going to need in the future, where when we become our own banks, uh, and then he gave this really long answer about why I should accept the current system, and the current system is good. We don't have to accept that anymore, guys. You don't have to pay a 3% transaction fee. It's your business. Um, if someone can send you money directly. So uh, we obviously have to balance privacy and security. Security is definitely something that uh, is needed more in the crypto space because when you become your own bank, you're responsible for your own money. We've been allowing the banks to make money on us and take care of our money and things like that. So, inner blockchain. Quinn's going to tell you a little bit more about blockchain, um, about uh, what the future of the DAP decentralized app space is going to look like. Uh, it does have the potential to change it all. It eliminates the trust gap that we have, where uh, you know everything's executed on smart contracts. And so, basically, once an action is done, it is done. Um, you don't have to worry about anybody intercepting that. And uh, you know, Rome, Rome is not built in a day, right? It's very cliche. But at the end of the day. Uh, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of this. So if you go look at some decentralized apps and try to play them and things like that, uh, whether it's a game or, or, or whatever it might be, you might be like, man, this thing is buggy. It feels like I'm on the internet in 1993, where it took like, you know, eight lines for a picture to download. And now we get upset if we get a circle for like one second. Um, but it's not built in a day. So this is basically a second layer to the internet is what blockchain is gonna be. So um, some people would argue third after mobile, but um, you know, this is something that's going to be a, a developing space. Uh, it's going to continue to grow. Uh, cryptocurrency is definitely a huge part of that. I love cryptocurrency. That's my YouTube channel. I talk about it all the time. Um, but the underlying technology of this is definitely going to change our lives 100%. It's going to wreck all kinds of industries. So uh, I'm going to let Quinn come on up, and he's going to talk about. Um, yeah. He's going to talk about trolling in the gaps. Thanks, Ben. Watch mine not work now, huh? We'll try a refresh. How's everybody doing? Let's get awkward up here, huh? Yeah. You guys see what happens when the internet. This is my second time ever public speaking, so if I go too fast or get nervous, I just throw a white flag at me and slow me down. I get excited. Um, yeah, talking to the mic helps, I guess, right? Or make this computer work. Uh, I guess I'll talk about myself until this loads up. Cool. My name is Quinn. I normally live in Ecuador full time, uh, in the States right now because my wife and I just had our first son, so awesome there. Um, I got into crypto through remittance as a cross border payment solution. I would use Western Union and send money to my family at home or vice versa to my wife in Ecuador. And after years of paying the 10 or 12% at Western Union, uh, I kind of found a better solution. And so this is just kind of what we're doing now. Ben talked to you about Decentralized America. Basically, it's a movement where we're trying to target colleges. Um, right now, the college space is kind of shy in its numbers for blockchain technology and schools and diplomas and curriculums. We're, we're hoping to start the conversation at least with events like this. Um, if you guys want that link to check out at, at any of the links that he posted or that I posted, we'd love any support that you guys want to offer us. 
Um, what I want to talk about is how blockchain is taking its place in this digital evolutionary role that we've kind of come to accept in society. So when I was in high school, Facebook came out, and at the time you couldn't get a Facebook account unless you had an EDU address. So the seniors at the school, which were all enrolled in colleges, had this new awesome app. It was amazing, it was fun, and everybody wanted to get a part of it, right? That changed, right? The, the, the delivery of this new system that gave us connectivity, that was able to kind of transcend cultural or age boundaries that brought together my grandma to watch videos of my son or my friends in Ecuador versus my friends in Australia, all enjoying the same content because this new program came along and gave us something that we really didn't know we needed. You know, at the time, all of our interactions happened in person. We were just handshakes or letters, but now it's all shifted to online. And I think soon enough that's, that, that change is not gonna be weird for us anymore. Everything will occur online, just like we've already started to do. Um, so when I was in high school, Facebook came out and it was kind of cool, but there wasn't actually a product that had utilized this evolutionary phase yet. There wasn't a real service that was coming in and providing something other than connectivity. You know, Facebook put us all together, but I was still using Barnes & Noble to buy my books. You know, I'd get my course credit with my scholarship, and to save money for my beer budget, I would go and find the cheapest books I could get and save as much money as I could. And at the time, that was Barnes & Noble, or it was like an on-campus used bookstore. Now, Amazon came out, and it was $80 cheaper. They were selling at a loss, and they did so for a long time. But doing that captured a huge market share. They were able to swallow up big portions of, of just people, of me, lots of me's, lots of students, that liked the idea of saving 80 bucks and having it delivered to my doorstep. Now, um, who right now goes to the movie theaters? Like, who goes and goes out on dates at actual movie theaters? Okay, so some good numbers. Who Netflix and chills? <laughs> Way more, right? So again, they came in and offered us this service that we didn't know we wanted or that we actually needed. You know, the idea that we could be at home and enjoy the movie theater experience from the comfort of our couch with the pizzas and the wife or whatever it was, it solved this problem we didn't even know we had. We didn't want to go to the theaters, we just wanted the entertainment factor. So it's not bad that these corporations came in and, and provided services and made huge amounts of money. What bothers me is they, they did it off of our backs, right? Our time, our attention is the monetary value within this equation, right? They aren't able to make money because we're nice to them, or we, it's only because of our ability to watch the ads or pay their fees. Now, when you started with Netflix, how much was your monthly bill? $7.99, right? What's your monthly bill now? $11, 12 15 for me, because I have like multiple TVs and stuff. What stops that from going up to 20 or 30? Now, that's what I'm trying to say is like, the technology is great. The, Middlemen owning the space and controlling the space is not because we are the currency in the space. Our attention, our ability to watch, our willingness to pay is what drives the, the future of this growth. So the DAPS space, um, a smart contract protocol is very similar to what it sounds like. It's a self-executing contract. So Tron, has anybody heard of Tron or Justin Sun? The movie. The movie. So yeah, nothing to do with the movie, but good branding, right? Um, Tron was born out of Ethereum. Ethereum is a smart contract protocol that existed on that exists now on the blockchain. It's the number two or three, depending on what's going on with the price um, blockchain in, in this space right now. And they do the exact same thing. They do smart contract protocols that can encompass a variety of services. We can do logistical transport, where I don't have to worry about anything. Just two companies can interact, or it can it can really go from any any industry that involves a middleman will be disrupted by these type of technologies. Um, why do I like Tron more than I do like the other ones? Uh, so Ethereum right now is the first one in the space. They have a very big decentralized web, but they can't handle the speed that is needed to scale at mass. So right now we're looking at a user space of maybe a million in total. Obviously, if we want the entire world utilizing the platform, we're gonna have to grow and scale to, to handle seven billion, eight billion, 10 billion eventually. So Justin Sun started this out of the Ethereum platform and evolved it to a faster, uh, cheaper version of that blockchain, and that's called Tron now. Tron is basically used for gaming dApps. Um, gaming dApps are gonna be casinos, and that's just because it was the easiest first step into the industry. It was the easiest ecosystem to disrupt via participation. So now I am an owner of the casino via my participation, just by playing. And that concept is gonna be applied across all spectrums. So you can see it in the casino right now because as I play, I earn the house token, I freeze the house token, and then I can earn rewards. 
but maybe in the future it looks like uh, content creation, where right now as a YouTubers, for every dollar of revenue that we generate, we only receive 44 cents. So that 55 cents is going, or 56 cents is going to YouTube, and you as a user don't receive anything. You watch my ads, you might click skip that, but you still watch it, and you're not compensated in any way. Wouldn't you like a system that maybe gave me 85% as a creator, you 10% for watching my, my ad, and then 5% is allocated to the actual platform for server costs or just the creator, somebody who actually designed the technology. So why is Tron gonna be the one that I think is kind of leading the way in this type of space? It's because of the speed, right? We have 27 nodes that are gonna handle thousands or millions of users at a time, and they are doing it right now. Um, it handles about 2,000 transactions per second. Visa is about 25,000 per second, so we're not there, but Visa is centralized. Visa can be hacked. You can't hack Tron. It would require you hacking all the networks across the world at the same time, which right now is not available. I mean, Google came out with their quantum computing system with their new quantum computer, but it still is not at, at, at the ability to catch up to SHA-256 uh, encryption rates. So until that happens, I'm not worried about any beating the cryptography of Tron. And in the sense, I'm not worried about my data. I'm not worried about hacks because it doesn't exist the ability to hack multiple computers across the world all at the same time. Um, it does, it's called a 51% attack, but that's not possible with this. Has anyone heard of a 51% attack? Okay, so some people, we got a large good crowd. Cool. Um, don't worry about that, that's on like other blockchains. It's basically just uh, an idea that if I can control more than half of the network, I can dictate what the blockchain states. Um, the idea that we are, um, these are just some, some basic stats on the other blockchain applications right now. Ethereum is, like I said, is the largest one. EOS is the second largest as far as volume goes. But when you're talking about security, it's a question. So uh, three weeks ago, EOS was hacked. EOS itself wasn't hacked. Somebody did a, uh, they used a casino DAP to hack the blockchain. And by spending $1,000, we're able to forward predict the results of the casino, which uses the blockchain. And, and, and inadvertently, not inadvertently, subsequently hacked $100,000 worth of tokens. So how can that happen? That shouldn't be able to happen off the Dow card gimmick. Well, it's because that type of technology is uh, vulnerable. You, it's not caught up to where we need to be yet. And that still is kind of happening today where I don't want to judge the end state of innovation with the current state of innovation because, hold the mic up, is it bad? I get better with that, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't want to judge the end state of innovation with the current state of innovation because it's hard to see where you're going you know, with what we're working with now. But I think that same concept could have been applied in 2002 or 2003 when everyone decided to go from desktop to your small little mobile phones. I don't think people at the time thought that a smaller screen or a smaller keyboard were gonna be the way to the future. But that's because we didn't have the vision to be able to see that the features built on top of those devices, the phones, we had cameras now or GPS devices built in that gave us things like Lyft and Uber or Instagram. You know, at the time we weren't able to see stuff like that, but those innovations led the way for the future. Um, so, have you heard the term DAP before this date? Yes or no? Yes? No. A DAP, all it is, is a decentralized version of an application. And from what Ben said, decentralized just means ownership is not in one central place. It's spread amongst the users. So, think of Facebook as the easiest one I can talk about right now. Why is Facebook being a central authority of data a problem? Cambridge Analytica should have showed that right out the gate. But you can see that in other instances. Like I don't, I, for the airport scenario, the storage for 14 days is great. My concern would be in the future is what other data points do they need to store that data or to reference that data? Are they gonna start pulling it from social media you know, eventually or is it only gonna be from the, the, the ICE picture that they're holding from the Secretary of State or wherever the, the process happens? I, I, I can see how Initially, we're going to start there, but then they're going to start using Facebook or other origins to source this, uh, this data to collect on us. Whether it's good or bad is, is not my call. You know, I personally want the government to know as little about me as possible and kind of stay out of my business. And if I need you, I'll come get you, but I pay you to stay over there. And I don't really want them involved in my life. I don't want them having my pictures that much. I, you know, I, I, I get the convenience factor. But for me, I get scared of overreaching governments. And I think that. That's, a, that's an American tradition. I mean, we, I, right now I live in Ecuador. Three weeks ago, we had a, a complete uprising. The whole country blew up over a tax, over the government saying that we're gonna take away a subsidy for a tax, so the price of gasoline was gonna go up. The whole country erupted. I mean, 
three weeks, the airport was shut down. He couldn't fly into Ecuador because they shut the airport down. He couldn't go anywhere. It shows me that that society is still kind of in this weird state of unrest, and earning the trust of the people back is one of the most important factors of moving forward. So what do the dApps look like right now? Um, they're really janky. So if you were to say, hey, look, I've gone on, I went on there, I've played these games, they're crap. I've played video games way better on PlayStation 4, and I, I would agree with you. But the difference is that these are decentralized. These are posted on websites all across the world. Um, they look very basic. They're casino dApps right now because, like I said, gaming was the easiest way to enter the market. Um, a distributed model for ownership is pretty easy to understand when I can go in and I can play, and as I play, I get rewarded. Um, if you go to a casino now, you can sit down and you can drink for free because you're gambling. That's kind of a built-in cost. Well, that budget, instead of going to drinking or to the lights or to whatever, let's put the, the casino online, make it digital, and now all the money that the casino makes goes back to the users, to the players. There's no house that keeps it. We are the house. It's easy to view that or to understand that, that approach with casinos, but that's going to go to every aspect of our lives. It's not just casinos. Um, has anybody seen this movie, Ready Player One? Anybody seen it at all? Do you know what this is, more or less? This is a DAP. This is a DAP right now that we haven't made yet. Um, for anybody that hasn't seen the movie, Ready Player One is a movie based on a virtual world where everything is done online. You know, people live, obviously, they're still alive, but they're at their homes, linked up, hooked up to their suits, to whatever it is, the equipment that they're using to enter this virtual world, and that's where they live. Now, I hope, personally, you know, I, I grew up playing outside, climbing trees. I hope that my kids do the same thing and that that's how life is. But the past has shown us that that's not really where we're going. You know, right now, it went from being able to order books on Amazon to I can buy my groceries, clothes, my computer. I don't have to leave my house if I don't want to because Amazon has allowed me to sit at home and be lazy. You know, in 2006, Amazon was worth $13 million. Sears, which is down there, I see you guys have one in here, was $25 billion in 2006. Closing next month. Closing next month, right? They just announced. So Amazon is worth $850 billion, and Sears is $25 million now. And in 10 years' time, that change happened because Sears wasn't able to adapt. The same thing happened with Blockbuster, Barnes & Noble, and it'll happen now in the future if these companies now don't adapt. So things like YouTube and Facebook, we feel are cemented. You know, Netflix is a powerhouse that's never going away. What if all those videos and movies were free? What if I went onto BitTorrent and I logged in and through my, uh, uh, my BitTorrent browser or through my BitTorrent service, maybe I wanna get paid today, I'm, I'm bored, I wanna make some money, so I'm gonna go into the ad viewing browser, I'm gonna just view ads all day, I'm gonna watch advertising, so I'll get paid some money, not a lot, but maybe three bucks an hour, four bucks an hour maybe. If you're in Ecuador where I live, or if you're in India, or if you're in a third world nation where three or four dollars an hour is a very big difference in income, that's life changing, right? The, the flip side would be the content creators. Me as a, as a producer, maybe I put out some content that I know I make $40 or 44 cents on, now I'm making 85 cents off of every dollar that's generated. I'm a lot more incentivized to make more content and to really grow my following because I want you guys making money. We, the system becomes about a, a community effort where the ownership is decentralized to the participants. I'm a participant for making it, you're one for watching it. And so the idea that we're in this evolutionary process and we can't realize it yet is, is not, out of, uh, it's not um, applicable because I'm sure that there were people back in 2003, 2004 that could see what was going on. They knew that the dot-com bubble had popped and everyone was saying, hey, look, it's over. We're, we're done. It, Amazon went from $110 down to $5. It gigs up, it's over. But the reality was it was just starting. You know, we hadn't realized what we, what we were able to do with the technology, and the same thing has happened with Bitcoin and blockchain technology. So right now, blockchain has given us this gift. Satoshi Nakamoto is supposedly the person that invented the technology. He's an unknown, anonymous person or persons, and it's free. This little internet 2.0 was a gift that nobody asked to get paid for and that we can kind of run with in any direction we want to. Um, the direction I hope we run in is, is that of decentralization in the sense of, I want everything to be decentralized. I don't want there to be a middleman for anything. I want my insurance company or my, if you sell a house right now in Florida, you have to pay how much percent on that house to two realtors, is it seven or six? Six, okay, that's awesome, but if you want to buy my house, 
I should be able to sell it to you directly without that 6% getting involved with anybody else. Lawyers, realtors, maybe a tax person or uh, someone to put a valuation on the house, but even then, the blockchain solves all that problem, all those problems because a smart contract can execute that. You don't have to depend on middlemen to verify. That's done through the smart contract with the technology at hand. So um, basically, that's about it, guys. We're real quick, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer some. Uh, ben, you want to grab a mic and just answer with me? Yeah, it's sweaty, man. I was nervous. Yeah. Go ahead. I just went through a maze to get it. I didn't have to do that. I don't know what this was. I love the reason for Curious, if either of you guys have an opinion on Stellar Lumens burning 50 billion tokens in this country. Yeah. If you can burn 50% of your um, supply, why can't you mint 50% of your supply? So. It's great. I love that they burn. They're a huge amount, but it's centralized. It, it, the foundation did that. It wasn't a community vote. It wasn't a their nodes spread out. We didn't decide as a community. They decided that. They burned those tokens to, and this is the crazy thing. They didn't burn their own tokens. They burned community tokens. So their actual holding went up from 18% of the supply to 24%. It's a real. I think it was a dirty trick. It was a. They tried to do a marketing gimmick to pump the price. And the people that actually looked into what was happening realized that they burned community tokens and increased their portion. And for me, as like an educated person in the space, it scares me that they did that. Like, how could you just do that without any authority or any other input? And if they can do that, they can do it the other way. Yeah, and, and I would say that it probably also had to do with the fact that um, you know they announced, uh, along with I think it's called Key, Key Store. Uh, they announced uh, maybe about six weeks ago that they were giving away like millions of dollars worth of tokens uh, if you just had accounts on certain websites. So what that did is, is that made the price dump. I actually know a project that is built on Stellar, and they've actually dumped Stellar over this whole thing. So um, a lot of people are upset about it. I mean, obviously, if you held Stellar, you were happy that the price went up 20%. Um, but, you know, the CEO said, I mean, the CEO basically said exactly what he said, which is uh, we wanted our coins to be worth more and to be valued at more. But I mean, really nothing is to stop uh, a lot of these projects from burning the extra supply. Um, so I don't know, maybe someone might want to think about putting safeguards in in the future for them. Go ahead. Hi, so uh, you mentioned using about, uh, achieving about 2,000 transactions per second, uh, and you are sort of four from Ethereum. So to the best of my knowledge, like Bitcoin achieves a transaction to put back to seven transactions per second. And Ethereum roughly between 24 to 30. Are you changing the consent protocol? Is it different slightly, or what modifications you're doing to achieve that? Well, it's a it's a different different consensus protocol. It's a completely different. Completely, it's a completely different system. Bitcoin is proof of work, which requires miners and transaction fees to relay the transactions. Whereas with a DPoS system like Tron, delegated proof of stake, uh, the governance is a lot easier, and transactions get sent faster. If you want to add? No, yeah, it's it's a it's a Can voting. Can you consensus protocol? DPoS? De delegated proof of stake. DPoS. DPoS, yes. yeah. right. Hey, uh, I've been having lunch with Warren Buffett, or is, was that like a fake out? Or a pump fake? So, uh, yeah, yeah, we actually got to go to that. It was really, we ate that lunch. It was delicious. Uh, Warren Buffett, he's you know, they canceled that the day before. We, we all flew out, we were yeah. excited about that. But the day before they canceled it. Um, and actually, somebody just published an article today with new updated information that he and I already published. I, I think that that was about China. I think we got caught in the, the middle of geopolitics. I think him inviting Trump caused a ripple effect back in China that they didn't like. Um, and you can already kind of see, we already have the trade war tensions, but if you like look specifically into the crypto space, uh, Zuckerberg was on Capitol Hill two weeks ago, a week ago, testifying about Libra, look, blockchain technology, crypto innovations, and why we need to compete with China, basically keep up. And four days later, President Xi comes out, the president of China, and announces basically just green lights blockchain with the country. Um, reverse their position completely on Bitcoin mining, reverse their position on blockchain innovation. So I think, uh, I mean, obviously I'd love for the Warren Buffett thing to happen. I think it was, I think it was all China. I think China put pressure on him to cancel that lunch. And being a foreign national, you know, like, you and I are Americans, right? We live in this great democracy. But the reality is, is that even though we don't acknowledge it, China's still a communist regime. They Absolutely. have real issues that don't even get acknowledged. And I don't really talk about it too much just because this is live streaming. I hope to work in China soon. But uh, the reality is, is that there's 
there's issues. And I, I, I think that the waves that the marketing side made from him not showing up sucked. But if you're able to kind of see like, oh man, this is a bigger issue. It's, it's China got scared because Trump got invited to this lunch and just the invitation alone spooked them to pull some strings. Offended. Yeah, they were offended, yeah. Anybody have any questions? The, the duck and the caviar was excellent, though. I'm glad I got so good, yes. I never had it. So, so I got the caviar. I don't know if you guys have ever had it before. I'm, I'm from North Georgia, so I'm not fancy like that. Um, but at, you know, we're at the, at the lunch with a very fancy uh, 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 Mich Quint's uh, Michelin three-star restaurant, right? Um, I, if you guys are into you know, Michelin, not the tires, maybe you know what that means. But uh, they brought the caviar, and it was on these little pieces of bread. And I said, Oh no, guys! I don't really eat uh, blackberries, and they thought it was a joke. They thought I was kidding. They're like, "Oh, he thought it was black." I really thought it was blackberries. And I bet I what it is. I, I tasted it. It was actually really good. So. so, so where do you think the future is for average people in a normal consumer environment using blockchain? Where that timing is? Is that a two-year thing, a five-year thing, a ten-year thing? I, I I would probably say closer to five years, um, because of it, you guys know what the worst law is. Moore's law. Yeah, it's basically that the you know the technology of computer processors it doubles every two years. Uh, but we actually broke that this year. So we're actually at, like Moore's law isn't a thing anymore. We're going faster than that. So technology is advancing at such an incredibly rapid pace. Um, but what it's going to look like for a lot of consumers is not necessarily like you know where you have Bitcoin and you're maybe spending it. A lot of people think Bitcoin's more like gold 2.0, which I'm also a person that believes that. I think we'll have another currency of the internet, whether it's you know any, any other number of coins. But imagine this, imagine you have an app and you walk into the grocery store and you know, you're know you a really crazy organic person and you want to scan your orange to know exactly where it came from. Well, you're going to be using blockchain and that's going to be supply chain, but to you, that's just going to look like an app that you're using. And I think for a lot of people, that's what it's going to be. You know, A lot of people have said that you know they really believe that when true adoption happens and when people don't even realize you're using it, you know? We don't even think about using the internet to go places. We don't sit there and say, like, oh, we are using the internet. Like, it's just a part of our life, and that's the way I see it happening. Um, I think probably five years, I'm, I'm a big believer that Bitcoin is going to have a huge run over the next one to two years, um, specifically leading up to May, and then probably another run at the end of next year. And people are going to know about this, and they're going to learn about this. But the actual use case of a lot of the blockchains, it is a, it is a little further down the road. Like I said, a, you try to use these dApps, they're buggy right now. I won't sit here and tell you they're better than a regular app because they're not. But your data is not stored on them. So there are some advantages to using them. Um, but yeah, that, that's my opinion. Yeah. Right, I killed it. It's a little dance move. Anybody have any other questions? Right, the front. What happens to the rest of the world? You're saying you're going to shut down casinos, uh, everyone's gambles from home. The person who gets down to point, the person who walks around with cigarettes, what happens when everything is replaced by whatever you're talking about, because I don't totally get it in the line. Right. So, um, evolve or die? Evolve or die, basically. Yeah. Say that again? Evolve or die. So just like what happened with Blockbuster. Yeah. Blockbuster, who would have thought in 1995, that 10 years later in 2005, Blockbuster would just be obsolete or going obsolete? I mean, nobody would have thought that. It was just the number one industry in America at the time, but they didn't they didn't evolve. And they had the ability to buy Netflix for a very cheap price. Very cheap. Um, so I, I think if, if these companies don't up their game, you know, you can't not, see- Not the companies, the individuals, yeah. the, the people who do the regular everyday, right. the janitor, yeah. the yeah. things like that, the woman who puts the towels the away dealers. or whatever. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing about it. And, and I mean, as heartless as it may sound, you know, what, what he said is true. Everyone's gonna have to evolve. But it, it's not going to be like one day the janitor walks in and they're like, oh, we're shut down. I mean, that does happen in casinos probably you know, all across the world almost every day. But it's going to be more of a transition, right, where we're, we're living in a new economy where you're able uh, – so I just started making daily content on TikTok. How many of you guys know TikTok? Okay. TikTok is a, is, a, is a fairly new app. It's over about the last year. It's really blown up. Gary Vee has been pushing it big time. I've been pushing it big time for a long time. Um, but 
Okay, TikTok, it's an app where you basically people lip sync, you, or you can make short videos. Vine was a very similar uh, platform a few years ago that ended up going out of business that uh, you know, would make six second videos. TikTok can either make 15 or 60 second videos. And there are people everywhere that you're able to create an account, and overnight, like one person I know created an account, and overnight, she had one video and she had 80,000 followers. She's now well, well over a million followers. Right, so it's kind of like, uh, and, and these people are monetizing this, these people are making money, brands are paying them to make silly videos and put their products in. So what I'm telling you is, the economy is changing and the value that people are bringing as content creators is going to be more valuable than jobs that people are doing. Or you as know, a viewer. Yeah, or, or even as a viewer of that content, you could, in the future, you can monetize that as well. So, um, you know, we, YouTubers, listen, we go talk to kids, and you know what they all want to be? They all want to be YouTubers. They want to be podcasters. How many of your kids want to be that? How many of them watch streamers? They, they don't actually play video games, but they watch They just watch streamers. Play video games. Right. That's content video, creation. Video games, in two years, over 75% of the world are going to be considered gamers, which means they regularly play video games. Ninja. What's that? Ninja. Yeah, like Ninja. Exactly like Ninja, right? He's making over a million dollars a month that's streaming. Free. And so That's a free game. But yeah. it has the biggest economy. It's a free right. game. Now, where does the money come from, though? It's the internal economy from buying swords or buying this, right. that, or the other. And they have to the buy the big bucks. Yeah. That's where crypto will come in. I mean, you'll see crypto so, take a huge role there. So, 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 so the point here is, is that while they're, while that person may not have a job as a janitor, or the dealers may not have a job as that, well, there are still live dealers even on the online casinos. But they can find jobs other places. I mean, I, people are pretty resilient, right? How many people do you know that like they lost a job 13 years ago and they just never got another job, right? Not many. Not many. People figure out stuff to do. So I think it's just going to create a different a different opportunity. I would argue that those same people use the internet to find jobs in the future. And I, I, it's harsh, I mean, I agree. It's, it's evolution, it's Darwinism. It's, look, you're gonna die if you don't evolve, and that's just how the reality of the world is. I mean, I don't know if that's what you believe, we're getting to the side road. The point is, is that the evolutionary process has proven itself to be what needs to happen for society to move on, and it's not gonna happen because, it just happens inside itself. It's whether you want it to, whether I want it to, whether I want my kids to be the ones growing up outside and playing video games or not, or, climbing trees, not playing video games, I, I don't really, I'm not in control of that because we're here where we are now. And so if blockchain disrupts those technologies, it'll do the same on the flip side of creating new opportunities. So exactly. just all those jobs that are lost, there will be 15 or 20 more created. I, I really do believe that. You know, if, whether the realtors are gone, the company that makes the realty, you know, uh, decentralized app will succeed and all those employees will be good. So I'll give you all a very old, Example, but do you remember carburetors? You guys remember carburetors? Yeah. Cars, right? Mechanics, they had a tune up carburetors back in the 70s. What happened in the 80s? Electronic fuel injection. Carburetors gone. But now that same mechanic got retrained and retooled exactly. and actually made more money working on a more complex system That's than he did point. working on carburetors. Yeah, so. great point, yeah. Guys, thank you so much for having me. Right, one more, one more. <laughs> Two claps. Yes. One, one, two, one, one, two. one more question. Last, last question. Last question. So, your slide has eight competitors. Long term, how much room is in the market? Are you going to come down to one? Uh, that's a great question. So, right now, the entire market cap of the entire space, all the space, is about what, 270, 270 billion? <laughs> Um, two, two, 252. It is a right before we went live. Excuse me, 252 for the whole space, right? Gold is a $7 trillion yeah. market cap. So um, 
there are going to be competitors that come into place and, and in the space, and, and I think there's so. I think there's so much space that we could add yeah. ten times the amount of competitors, and it wouldn't be enough. To be honest, I, you know, it's 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 competition. They need to compete for us, and I want as many of them competing for me as possible. Yeah, well, I would say also, though, that it is important to understand that uh, while there are new coins and new blockchains popping up every single day, we are starting to see what I believe is a, a first mover's advantage for decentralized platforms, where Ethereum, EOS, and Tron are all very, very ahead of the next competitors. And we were even talking about this. Um, I actually run a block producing node for IOST, which was one of the uh, you know, companies up there. And I actually really like IOST. It's very decentralized. There's a lot of stuff I like about it um, that make it a great blockchain. But even as great as it is, it's having such a hard time penetrating that upper level of the market. So um, I think that Tron is definitely, in my opinion, um, and they're not paying me to say this, but in my opinion, Tron is the decentralized platform that I think is going to succeed um, you know, for a multitude of reasons. But everybody's going to keep trying to chip away at that because as we all know, this is big money. I mean, we're talking about $7 trillion versus $252 billion, but let's say facts, $252 billion is a lot, and 66% of that is Bitcoin, so even that remaining amount is still a lot of money. Oh, he knows. I, yeah, two cents. I definitely know. It's, uh, I, Tron pays my bills, so I use the app <laughs> space to pay bills, and every day I literally will, whatever I've made from my income, I convert it into U.S. dollars and pay the bills. So, they're, yeah. they're passive income, not the Tron, not, yeah, not the, yeah. the company Tron pay. No, 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 I make residual income yeah. off of my Tron DAP. So by owning various DAPs through my participation, I earn income from the other people that are using this. So that's how that works. What would you say about the Samsung? Samsung partnership. So yeah, moving forward, uh, this happened three days ago actually. Every single Samsung yeah. phone moving forward will have a Tron wallet on it. A Bitcoin wallet, an Ethereum wallet, and a Tron wallet. Um, that was announced three days ago at their big event in San Francisco, and uh, I, those are the kind of steps that will lead to mass adoption and, and hit us critical mass, because every single phone from here and everywhere will have a wallet that you can send and receive coins on. Um, it takes away the difficulty for entrance. You know, right now, that's one of the issues, is how hard is it to set up a wallet? Well, it's on my phone, it's just as, as easy as using an app. And if, if you guys want, we just had this brought up. This, this will show you how early we are in Bitcoin. It basically explains uh, Bitcoin is valued just a little bit more than uh, you know Jeff Bezos uh, and his family. It's the so orange dot. It's the orange dot. The tiny orange dot is Bitcoin. Uh, the biggest one over there being all money. So you guys can see it's got a lot of room to grow, and this is definitely going to be a very exciting uh, emerging space. So thank you. thank you guys. By the way, these guys are out in California. And we've got some door prizes. Don't go anywhere. So I hope you guys really like that. Love the beach.